Happy Sabbath, Tantal and SDA Church. And whether I'm just meeting you for the first time or if you're a regular member, thank you for welcoming me into your home. Now, there's only two announcements today, so it shouldn't be too long. Uh, but uh, three announcements, I suppose, if I include this one. Uh, we have a guest speaker today. His name is Mark Ricalde. He's a good friend of mine from high school. Um, and our lives are kind of... Kind of come and diverge and come together and diverged a few times as I, I went to Australia, he went to Berman, and then I came back to Berman and he uh, went to Winnipeg and kind of all over the place. Um, but I am very, I feel very, very lucky to have such an incredible friend. Um, he is currently doing his master's uh, down at La Sierra. He worked as a pastor in the Mansask conference for a few years. Um, and I know that he will present an amazing message for us today. So the other two announcements before I hand it off to Mark is, uh, number one, um, I just want to say that we do have a Monday evening uh, prayer meeting. Uh, so we do still have a weekly prayer meeting, but it's on Zoom. Um, I'm mentioning this because there have not been too many of us going to it. So I just thought I'd uh, put a little re, a uh, little reminder out there uh, for all of us that there is still a weekly uh, prayer meeting, but it's on Zoom. It's a, on Mondays at 6.30. And if you want the Zoom uh, meeting ID and password, uh, just uh, send me a text. Give me a call uh, and I'll, I'll send it through to you. Uh, also, um, the, the next item... Uh, our last announcement, these announcements really are going quick, is uh, this week and next week we are beginning trial drive-in church services. If they go well, then I will stop doing these YouTube uh, videos altogether and we'll completely move to just the drive-in services. Uh, so this week, uh, which you, if you're watching this, will probably have missed or are missing right now, um, we tried to get the word out. If by some chance uh, you missed the first one, that's all right. Uh, there will be more. Uh, but yes, we are transitioning into drive-in church services as our next step uh, towards getting everyone back together at the church building. Uh, so very excited for this first step. Very curious to see how it turns out. Uh, and uh, I can't wait to see you at our next drive-in service. But because it is just a trial and this is a transition period, if you are watching this, I hope that uh, I hope that you learn and grow from it. I know that uh, I know that I'm very excited to hear what Mark has to share with us today. So without further ado, I hand it over to him. Good morning, Tantalian Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, my name is Pastor Mark, and I am uh, excited to be able to share the message with you this morning. Um, before I begin, I think I'd like to just introduce myself and uh, my friendship with Pastor Sean Todd. Uh, Sean and I met when we were in grade five, I think. Um, he and his family um, had moved to Calgary. Um, his mom was gonna pastor a church there. And uh, we were in the same grade and we got to know each other um, pretty well. We became pretty close friends of playing sports and school and a little bit of music um, and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, as high school uh, finished up, we went our separate ways and he went to Australia um, and I went to Berman University uh, to pursue our religious studies. Um, and it's just so cool how life um, intertwines and uh, intersects uh, because uh, a couple years later, he did move back to Lacombe to take religious studies there. And we were a couple years apart, uh, so we didn't have a lot of classes together. Um, but uh, we were both in the same field. Um, and I went on to a uh, pastor in the Mansas Conference in Winnipeg. Um, and uh, this last summer, we had the joy of being able to work at summer camp together um, and to do ministry at Camp White Sands in, in the Mansas Conference. Um, and now he is in... Uh, Nova Scotia pastoring with you guys and I'm excited for what God has in store as you guys partner together um, in growing in Christ and also in ministering um, to your community. Uh, we're quite far away now. We're uh, a continent away, uh, four hours, four time zones. Um, but it's been so cool to be able to call 
um, and see how we're doing and, and kind of compare notes and, and learn. We're both pretty new in ministry and trying to find out uh, how to do it best and how to uh, support and learn and grow uh, together in it. Um, so I'm here in California. I'm doing my Master's of Divinity at La Sierra uh, University and also um, I'm the assistant youth pastor here at Cala Mesa uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to be able to be here this morning with you guys uh, with the help of technology um, and to be able to talk a little bit about uh, this book, uh, the book of Revelation. Um, Sean has told me that you guys are going through uh, this book uh, with a specific focus. You guys are trying to find um, where you can encounter Jesus. Uh, where is Jesus in the text? Um, what do we learn about Jesus and how is how is he present? Um, and uh, being the revelation of Jesus Christ, I think that you guys are going to find him over the coming months again and again and again. Um, but today we have the joy of exploring through the fourth chapter of the book. Um, now I think it would be a good idea if we were kind of all on the same page with the imagery and kind of what it's like. So I would like you guys to uh, take your Bibles out and read through the chapter on your own. Um, I'm going to allow you guys to just uh, hit pause real quick, uh, read through the chapter, get a bottle of water, um, and then uh, hit play again as we dive into this chapter. Hit pause. All right. All right, um, Tantalin, uh, I hope that you guys have uh, read through the chapter um, of Revelation chapter 4. And as we go into this, I hope that uh, we'll be able to find uh, some new ways to worship. Uh, this chapter, as you have read, is really a worship talk. There's a lot of worship and, and praise and honor um, being given uh, to God in this chapter. Um, but before we really get into it, let's just say a quick prayer. Uh, dear Jesus, I just want to thank you uh, so much that uh, you are a God who is into revealing. Uh, you want to be made known. Uh, you want us to, to be able to find you and discover you and, and learn um, learn your love. I pray that as we open up this chapter that you reveal yourself to us once again. Um, please uh, be with me as uh, I, I go through this uh, chapter and I just pray that our hearts may be open to your leading. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so uh, Revelation chapter 4 uh, follows the section on the messages to the seven churches, um, which you guys have taken the last two weeks to go through. And in this uh, message to uh, the seven churches, there is a little bit of symbolism and there is some prophetic time that is moving forward, uh, but it's really practical. Um, each of us can read uh, each of the messages and say, hey, that is a principle that I can apply to my relationship with God. Um, and for the church at the time, uh, Jesus is giving each church a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down or both, um, and then giving them a call to action. And then saying, if you, if you choose to take that action, there's a promise. There's, there's a victory to be gained. Uh, whether it's not at the moment, it might be in the future, but victory is to be gained in Christ. Um, and, and we finish this, this section, um, and John is here on the island, and a door opens in the sky, and it is a door to heaven. And as John is looking through this door, um, the Son of Man uh, calls to him. And he turns, and, he's, and the Son of Man says, hey, come up here with me. And I mean, like, who's to, who's to say no to the Son of Man? And John says, let's go. And this is what it says. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. Now, this chapter is rich in symbols. Uh, there's uh, numbers. Um, Gemstones, lightning, colors, animals, eyes, uh, a lot of uh, metals, and, and a lot of this, this stuff makes it kind of hard to navigate uh, through what exactly is going on. Um, but with a lot of biblical scholars in the past who we can lean on, um, we have a, a lot of certainty, not 100% with prophecy. I don't think we can ever be 100%, uh, but we have a good idea of what is going on. Um, and as we navigate uh, through this chapter, I think we'll find the core of what it means uh, to worship as worship is shown um, in this heavenly throne room. Uh, that being said, uh, the key in this chapter is this throne right here. Um, thanks to Mark Berry for this diagram. Uh, 
this is a description or a picture of all of like the entities at play in chapters 4 and chapters 5 of Revelation. Um, and as you can see right in the middle right there, we have the throne. Um, it's actually uh, so, so key to this whole book, uh, but specifically in this chapter, it's mentioned uh, 14 times alone, just in this chapter. And whenever it's mentioned, it's mentioned with one of these other entities um, looking back in or worshipping back in or focusing back in on the center, the throne. And on the throne, obviously, there's someone seated. Um, and John describes the one seated on the throne uh, quite sparsely. He says uh, the one on the throne is like Jasper and Carnelian, which, I mean, to us, doesn't mean anything at all. Um, but to the people reading it, it still would have meant not much. It would have meant uh, he's shiny and, and colorful. Um, that's not a lot to go on. It's actually quite shocking that it's, it's so simple that he describes this, seeing how in chapter 1, when he witnesses uh, Jesus the Son of Man, he describes with such detail. Uh, the power and, and the hair um, that is white and woolly and, and snow-like, the eyes of fire, the feet that are they're burnished and, and shiny bronze, and uh, we have the trumpet that's, I mean the trumpet voice that's also like a waterfall fall voice all in one, and this, this power of the Son of Man who reaches down to, to John and says, don't be afraid. That's a very different picture of what we see here. What we see here is something that can't be described. And I think here John is being a very true to his Jewish roots. Um, in, in the Old Testament and in Jewish culture, God is so holy that his name is not said. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard this, that Yahweh was not mentioned. So instead, they said Elohim or Adonai or Lord or Jehovah. Um, because the, the actual name of God was too holy to be said. And God alone, in some ways, is too holy to be described. You can't put him in a box. Um, hence, why Jesus was often accused of, of heresy. Um, and I think John chooses to, to not describe what is on the throne. And in dis instead describe everything around the throne to bring kind of and awe and holiness to highlight that what is who is on the throne is is so special just the description is not enough um, and I use that word holy in the classical sense I think in Adventism we've always said like oh what does holy mean it means to be set apart and that is true um, God calls us to live holy lives uh, where uh, we are the salt and the earth we are not um, of the world but we are in the world um, and in that way, it's true, God calls us to be holy. But the holiness that's seen here is a holiness that humans can achieve. It's one that is divine and, and perfect and worthy by nature. Um, one that can only be attributed to God. And here on the throne is the center of worship. Now, in, in this center throne, uh, coming out of it, we have lightning and thunder, uh, rumblings. And these all attest to the power um, of God. But also around it there's a, a rainbow and from it there's a, a sea of glass that extends and this can represent the hope and the mercy of God and also the truth um, and the transparency that God has. Um, and in that grand picture, it, it, it's quite grand of what the throne is, there's these seven um, torches which John tells us are the seven, seven uh, spirits of God. And as, as we look outside of these circles, I'm just going to point out these entities real quick. Some of them are in chapter 5, so we won't talk about them today. Uh, one of them being the Lion of Judah, the Lamb that was slain. Um, and then how he uh, ends up also becoming the focal point of worship. Um, in next week's chapter, you'll see that. Um, then we have these 24 thrones, which are the 24 elders, which we'll talk about in a bit. And then these four angel, human-like, animal-like beings um, that also worship God. Um, next week and in the coming weeks, you'll see how thousands of angels are in this outer circle watching what is happening in this throne room and taking part in worship. And then there's this outer circle of all creation. Um, everything in the universe is pointing to the throne, saying, we worship you, God. And now let's unwrap 
why that happens. And we're gonna do that by looking at these two entities, the, the, all these 24 thrones and then these four beings as described in Revelation uh, chapter four. So in verse four, it says this, and around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. Uh, there's a lot of symbolism here. Let's break it down. Let's talk about the number 24 first. Um, there's two roots that scholars take here. Um, the first is that um, in the Levitical order um, of priests, uh, we have 24 main groups. And each of these 24 groups had like a chief or a leader. And traditionally, they were called uh, the elder. Um, also, in the temple, there was always 24 singers um, singing. Uh, the, the next, so in that route, we see... Um, paying homage to the priesthood, but also uh, signs of worship. We see singers and, and priests were acting as the worship leaders of the nation. Um, worship is being set down by John. The next route is seeing this as two sets of 12. The 12 being uh, the covenant uh, group of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the next is the new covenant group of the 12 apostles. And these groups are the groups that through God and the covenant and through Jesus Christ are victorious and gain access and authority on these thrones. And this truly is um, victorious language. Um, in the last two chapters to the messages, in these promises, we saw promises of a crown to the church of Smyrna. Uh, we see promises of authority to Thyatira, the promise of white garments to Sardis, and to those who overcome lukewarmness, we see the promise of a throne. And all those promises are fulfilled here in this verse to these elders, and as a whole, they represent a worship-leading group who is the victorious humans through Christ. That is what's represented here. And this group worships God. Let's look at the next group. And all around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. Uh, the passage goes on to talk about their six wings and their many eyes. And when you, when you try to draw this out, it, it's, it's quite scary what you see. Um, but it's clear when you look through the whole Bible that we're talking in cherubim in angel language here. Um, what is that? A cherubim are, are known as like the covering angels on the Ark of the Covenant. They're all, always seen as the angels closest to God. Like if there's tiers of angels, this is the top tier. Um, in Isaiah, they're the ones who cover the mercy seat where God's presence is. In Ezekiel, they're, they're the ones who are moving um, and holding the throne where God sits. And uh, they're almost always described in this way with eyes all around them that represent um, wisdom, but also a shininess and, and glory. And we have these four, sometimes four wings, sometimes six wings that represent uh, speed and, and the, the importance of the expediency of their message. Um, and then we have the face. Uh, there's four faces for the four angels, a lion, an ox, um, the man, and the eagle. And uh, some scholars suggest that this represents the full spectrum of creation. We have the lion, the most majestic, the ox, the strongest animal, the man, the wisest, and the eagle, the quickest. And in here, we have all the, the glory and the power of the creator represented. And all of creation represented here through these four angels also worship God. So we have these two groups that are worshiping God. Let's see how they worship and why they worship this, this one on the throne. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Here we're shown a constant act of worship. Once the, act, once the worship is done, it restarts again. And it restarts with this phrase that God is holy, that he is, is divine and, and worthy and, and perfect because of this, he was and is and is to come. Uh, this language is used by John earlier in chapter 1 uh, to describe God as well. And I think in a broad sense, it's true that all the way this way in time, before time could begin, God was there. And today God is here and way in the future, 
when everything ends, if everything, like beyond time, God is still there. God, God is beyond dimension. Um, but I think this specific language points to three specific modes of God's revelation, um, God's coming, um, the way that God encounters and, and chooses to come down to us, the was, the is, and the is to come. Um, I'd like to take some time to, to reflect on that on the grand scale of human um, life and then also on the personal scale of human life. Um, so first, let's look at the, the very beginning revelation of who God was in creation and covenant. Um, Genesis and John chapter 1 tell us that the Godhead comes together to create the earth, the stars, the land, the sea, the animals, humans. And it's all like really, really good. And then this journey begins of this journey of love and relationship between God and humans. It gets disrupted with sin. And because of that disruption, like God, God has to reveal himself to us again. So he comes down and reveals himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's a revealing through covenant. And he says, I am going to do something great through your offspring. There will be a blessing through your offspring. There is a promise to be told. And that is the way God met us as humans. And if, if that relationship is the one that God wanted to be repaired, that relationship between God and humans, he made a big move in the God who is. Jesus coming down, Christ in action, the fully God, fully man on earth to pay for our sins. And it's this encounter is one that's more than just salvific. It's also an encounter where we get a glimpse of, of the Father. Jesus says, if you've seen me, um, as in if you've seen the way he lives and what he teaches, you'll see love, you'll see who God is. Um, and that is the, a big revelation, a big encounter humanity has with Jesus, with God as man. And the last one, the God who is to come. And as Adventists, we do this really well. The second coming or, or the completion, the consummation of the plan. Um, Jesus is going to come again and he's going to wipe out sin, wipe out tears and sadness and, and, and pandemics and all these things that are around us that are bad. Um, God's going to get rid of them so that there are no longer any barriers between us and him. And just like at creation, we are together again and that journey of growth and, and learning about God continues. And that is the way that God moves. The God who was, the God who is, and the God who is to come. And truly, that is a God who is worthy of worship. A God who is divine and, and holy. Next, we're going to look at the second set of worship. So, we have these four angels that proclaim this God who, who was in creation. Um, the God who is and also the God who is to come. Um, and this group now, the 24 elders, in hearing this praise, they are spurred on to respond. And this is what they say. Um, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed, and they were created. Here, we see the, the next level of why God deserves to be worshipped. Because God is a creator. God just doesn't come at the beginning and in Jesus. Um, and he just doesn't come to tell us what is right, to reveal who he is, uh, to save us. He does those things and then says, but also in this relationship, I'm going to make something new in you. He made a new earth at the beginning. In, Je in Jesus, he made a new people in the covenant. In Jesus coming, he created a new way of life, a new kingdom um, with new consequences when you choose Jesus. And at the end times, he comes again to create a new, a new heaven and a new earth. God is a God who creates. And I think that we, we really like that idea. And it's easy to, to say. Um, but it's so easy to say that we say it about a lot of things. Um, uh, for example... We really like the idea of creating a new way of life in our own lives. We want to lose weight. Um, we want to um, enjoy uh, 
life in new ways. We want maybe different things so people can see us in new ways. Um, we want our, our relationships that are maybe older and tired to get new life. We want our children to, be, to, to grow up and to grow and mature in new ways. Um, and the world gives us answers for these. Um, they give us uh, different lifestyles and, and things we can buy to get fitter, and they give us uh, certain lifestyles we can subscribe to to become richer or, or to get more knowledge so people can see us in a certain way. They even give us standards that we can hold our, our family to so we can have a goal to change for the better. Um, but all these goals, these ways to try to transform ourselves, often end up just being distractions because the only way that we can get true creation, a true, this is the old me and now there's a new me, is through this God. The God who was and is and is to come and who is constantly creating in those encounters with us. Um, I think that all of this prophetic grand life uh, scale can also be brought down to my life. Um, if I look in my life, um, I'm only 25, and I can look back, and it's, it's funny how hindsight really gives us this power, and I can see in certain times in my life that God encountered me, that God revealed himself and put me on a path to be where I am now, the God who was. And Daily as I, I struggle and wrestle with what it means to be a Christian, to what it means to follow God, to what it means to claim the cross, um, I really find that Jesus becomes present in my life, that he's creating a new way of life in me. And the God who is to come gives me a hope for the future. And I'm not just talking about the resurrection. He gives me a hope for tomorrow, for what the gospel could mean for my community in action next year, for how the church is moving, a hope for a future with God in it. The God who was and is and is to come and is creating new things all in that. This beautiful God who deserves to be worshipped. Uh, when I was a kid in Sabbath school, my teacher gave me this poster. And uh, this poster said, a day hemmed in prayer is likely to, is less likely to unravel. Let me say that again. A day hemmed in prayer is less likely to unravel. And then in big words um, at the bottom, it said, come boldly to the throne of grace. I've ha I had that poster on my wall for years. And never once did I really think about the image of the throne. Um, I just thought of it like, hey, I just got to come to God's presence and pray. And what that looked like was I, I pray for things, I pray for things in my life that were going wrong or thank him for things that were going good. And my praise often looked like songs um, of adoration or, or songs like I would learn that God is faithful. So I would sing, um, great is thy faithfulness. And it was this kind of relation where the circle of my praise and the circle of my prayer was really around my own personal feelings and experience to God. Um, and in, in that way, I was focusing more on myself and bringing God into that instead of focusing on the throne of who God is and bringing myself into that. Um, now when I praise, it looks a lot different. I think the songs I sing are the same. Uh, the prayers, sometimes I, I, I still ask for things. I still thank God in the same ways, but there's a certain reflectiveness that comes before it's a reflectiveness in, in seeing the way I have encountered myself and God, the way he's revealed himself to me in the past, the way that I'm uh, experiencing him in my life today and how that changes every day what tomorrow could look like and how my life is a canvas of creation for God. Um, it's really changed the way that I worship, changed the way that I, I see God. This focus of moving from myself and God to focusing on who God is on his throne and how I move within that. Um, I hope and pray that you make it your goal to live a life of reflective worship where you can reflect on the way God is revealing and come boldly to the throne. I'm not asking God to come to you as you boldly ask but instead to come see the God who is creating 
past, present, and future in your life and in the world. Let's pray. Um, dear Jesus, I just want to thank you so much that you are a God who is on the move. Um, you've been on the move, you're on the move today, and you have plans for tomorrow. Um, I pray that you help us to be reflective and to be responsive to way, the way that you are revealing yourself to us. Um, and help our worship to stem from that, um, instead of stemming from some selfish things that are within us. I thank you that you are a God who is able to create that new kind of life in us. Um, we live to worship you. In your name we pray, amen. Oh